thing. And what we'll do is I'll stick myself as spotlight. So anybody napping, yapping in the background isn't going to bugger up the video. Set up so that uh, you can see what we're talking about. Um, well, the first thing I'm going to do is work. I'm going to tie. Uh, I'm not sure why I came up with it. The vampire leech. It was something I was looking at online and decided maybe I should do this. Um, so here's here's a, a range of them that I played around with. Now, uh, the basic pattern is like this guy here in the middle at the end, this, the second one from the end. And that, that uses a, uh, just a marabou tail and a, a couple of pieces of flash in built into the tail and then a marabou wound body with this chartreuse bead and a little bit of a wire rib. Now that was the first uh, balance leech that I saw Phil Rowley tied. And then later on, he, he came up with a, the same pattern basically, except instead of a wound marabou body, he used uh, a sort of a chenille material. And the other kind for the smaller fly uses this, this sparse uh, straggle string stuff. So when I went looking for materials at Robinson's to tie, first off, I had difficulty finding uh, black chenille. Uh, so I found a few things that I can use. And so this is why it's variations of the pattern is what can you do with the materials that you have access to? Uh, and the second thing is the original one that I saw Phil Tai, uh, which is, which is this guy here, put this over here. Which is this guy here. He used a funny bead that I have not seen before that looks like it, it's like a, a float that's got a little tang at the bottom that goes over the hook and the bead kind of sticks out over the front of the hook. And he said, well, if you get this particular bead and use it, it will actually be like a balanced leech. It's a slotted type bead. Now, I've seen other ones that use slotted beads and the reason for the slotted beads is, and, and that's, that's these guys here. These are uh, slotted beads. Uh, these were amongst the, these were like 10 bucks for a bag of, of slotted tungsten beads. The reason for the slot is that trying to get a slotted bead on a fairly sharp bend hook, uh, it won't go around the corner. Uh, so the hooks that I've been using, uh, I've got them in three different sizes. I figured it tied three different sizes. So this, uh, this is a number eight. This is a Hanuk barbless jig hook. And a regular bead that is, uh, is roughly uh, this four millimeter, three and a half, three and a half millimeter bead, a decent weight bead. It won't go around the bend if it's not a slotted bead. Uh, so you have to get the slotted ones to get them around the bend. Uh, so I tied some of these that have, have the Dave, slotted beads. Dave, yeah. Dennis here. Uh, can you please define what's a balanced leech? You know, the one balanced leech I, I would think of was the eye comes out from behind I'm, I'm, the beat. I'm coming to that. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm coming to that. Okay. Uh, so, so I tied some of these that just have the slotted bead right up, right up to the eye of the hook. And you're correct, they don't float balanced. And those were a lot of the original uh, patterns that, that pattern was originally produced by a fellow by the name by, of Todd Oishi, who's from uh, Maple, Maple Creek, I think now. He moved out of Vancouver. And Todd's a competitive fly fisherman. He, He's run the Canadian international fly fishing team for many years. And he developed this pattern for competition fishing. And it, uh, it's not a balanced pattern. 
So it obviously works because he's done fairly well in that competition and he's used that as pattern in various places. Uh, but I kind of like the way a balanced leech performs more so than a, a regular one. Now, a balanced leech, the difference is, if I can get this up here, this is what you do with a balanced leech. You put it on a, you put the bead on a pin out in front of the eye of the hook and then tie the pin down to the hook shank. I'll go through that in a minute. Uh, for a balanced leech, you don't need a slotted bead because you're putting the bead onto a pin. And if you get the right pin size, you can see that it doesn't go through the hole. Uh, if you don't get yeah, if you don't get the right pin, it'll slide right through the hole, it won't stay on. Uh, so you have to play around with the, the beads and the bead size and the uh, pin that you're using. I've, I've done balance leeches before, so I'm not gonna repeat the process other than just to give you a, a quick instruction on what it entails. Um, I have these, a little thing that you can buy for cheap at the, uh, at the sewing store. These are uh, sequin pins and they're really small and short. And you can use regular dressmaker's pins but you have to cut them, at, you have to chop them off on the end to get them to sit on the, be, be not be too long. So there's, there's the pin. And it's got a, a fairly small head. If, you, if the bead has too big a hole, the head will go right through the bead. The, head of the pin will go right through the bead. But for this particular pattern, I'm using these uh, 3.5 millimeter beads. And I just take a, the bead and, and I put it through so that the, and, and because I, I don't have some non-slotted chartreuse beads, I bought these beads originally to do the traditional pattern. Uh, I have to play with, uh, I have to do, find a way to do these with the slotted beads. So what I found is I put the bead on with the slotted part facing the pin. And there's a reason for that. So there's the bead with the slot at the front. Now we'll get the, the hook in the vise. And I'll do this very quickly so you can see what's up to. I'm using a three out thread, just black. And I'll start right where the bend on the jig hook is bending down. Now the balance leech uses a jig hook because it gets the eye of the hook out of the way so that when you attach it to your line, the eye of the hook, the line goes into the eye of the hook and then the beads out in front. And what that does is that balances the leech so that it, it floats horizontally when you tie your line, your tippet to the eye of the hook. So you got to counterbalance against the, the weight of the hook, the body material. So I take the bead on the, on the pin and I will set it down on the, on the hook on top and I'll take a few wraps around just to kind of get it in place. Now the trick is you have to get it balanced so that the eye is the, the, the bead is far enough in front to balance the weight of the hook. And you have to do a little bit of trial and error. So I have a little piece of wire that when I do the first couple with a given bead and hook size, I put this through the eye of the hook, take it out of the vise and hold it and see how it balances. And then in this stage, I will adjust the bead so I, it's the right distance in front of the eye of the hook. Now, I've done that with this combination hook and eye. Whoops. So I now know where to put the bead. And for this particular hook and eye, it, I want a little less than the diameter, uh, about the eye width in front of the eye. I want that bead to sit there 
bottle eye width in front of the eye. Now, once I get it on the pin, on there, I need to come up in front of the eye of the hook, and I need to make a a great big bump of thread in behind the bead to keep the bead from sliding back. So now you can see I've got this gap in there. And that's about the right distance, about an eye width for this particular combination. Sometimes it'll be a little further up front, sometimes a little bit closer. Uh, when I got when I got picked the right size, it's close enough to, to balance this way with this hook and, and bead combination. Um, once I've got that, I will very quickly get my super glue and just do a little dab of super glue on the thread there to make sure it doesn't move once I got it tied down and balanced. And then I'll come back and just over wrap it to make it smooth at the back. So that's, this one is actually a size, uh, size eight hook. So, and I had, I prepared a bunch of these. So there's another size eight. So I've got a couple of those. So now when I get here, I'm gonna come back to the very back of the hook. And wrap the thread right down to where the bend starts. And then I'm going, this, this gives a base for my body and everything to attach the hook. I'll bring the thread back up to just about a third of the way back from the eye. Now I'm gonna put the tail in. The tail is, I got these good marabou plumes that have nice long fibers and are nice and soft. Uh, I'm gonna take a good chunk of them off of one side and I'm gonna bunch them up and gently roll them, pull them off the shank of the feather so that the tips are fairly, fairly well aligned. And that's probably enough. I don't want a hor horribly bulky tail. I may, I may need it some more later. So to put the tail length, I measure from the bead back to the bend of the hook. Then I'll slide it, those fingers with my right hand down to where I'm gonna tie them in. And then I'll move my right hand up to where the thread is hanging. And I will wrap over top of the marabou there. And I will hold it up above the marabou, up above the hook. Shank, get this out of here. And I will wrap this back over top of this, holding it up slightly so it sits on top of the hook. And I'll do that all the way back to the bend. Then I'll lift the tail up and I will do a couple of bends wraps in behind. What that does is that makes that tail stand up a little bit. And I got a couple of strays in there. All right. I'll come up with my scissors. Where I put them? And uh, cut this off just behind the eye of the hook. Get my get my waist bin down here so that Excess marabou doesn't end up on the floor where I can't get it out of the carpet. <laughs> and that's that's the start of the tail. Now I will come forward just to the hook point. I'm gonna put a little bit of flash. And I, I think this is why they call it a vampire, which is because it looks like it's got a little of a bit of a blood tail behind in the tail. Uh, so I'm using this Basically, it's a crystal flash, and it's red, blood red, I guess you could call it. And I've got a 10 people's lifetime supply of this stuff here. I'm going to take a single strand out. 
And this stuff is really fine. It's very floppy and very fine. And it's a little bit hard to manage because of that. I will cut that in half because I don't need much length. Um, just we're off camera here, I'm gonna cut it in half. So I have two, two strands now. Now the pattern that I've seen says, oh, you only need one, but I don't like it with just one. I think I want a little more flash in there than just one. I wrap my thread around the, the sorry, the flash around the thread. Now I'll bring, bring it up and I'll tie it down on top of the hook and work it back towards the back, holding the flash on the near side of the hook. And what that does is that ties the flash parallel to the hook shank. Now I'll quickly bring my thread back up to that point and take the next piece of crystal flash, wrap it around the, the thread, pull it down and put it on top of the shank again, and then wrap back towards the tail. And the whole purpose of that is to have one on one side and one on the other, it's not buried in the marabou, but, and then I'll trim it off right at the end. So now I've got a little bit of red flash on either side of the marabou. The problem with this stuff is it has a tendency to kink. It's very fine. All right. Now, if you were gonna do the original body and make it skinny, what you would do at this point is you'd get a whole bunch more marabou off the, the stem and tie it in by the tip right behind about there. And then you will spin that marabou and wrap it around. But that makes a very skinny body and not very fuzzy. So I've decided if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna use something that gives a little more bulk to the body of a leech. And I've got some crystal chenille. There's one that's called black, which has more pur purple and black, uh, but it works. I'm going to take a uh, chunk of this off the, the spool. Dropping everything in the morning. And I will peel a little bit of the crystal ch chenille part off of the tag end of the, the ch chenille. And I'll just tie that string that forms the basis of the chenille in on the hook shank. And then bring my thread up forward and put it right behind the bead. And I'm gonna do a very quick, very quick uh, whip finish here because I'm gonna use my rotary vise to do this next step. Let me just get that on there. Bring my bobbin rest up in front and hang the thread there. Now to make this, uh, this chenille nice and fuzzy, it, it's, you can see it's not nice and even. It, it's kind of sparse in places and, and it's not nicely wound. And that may have something to do with the vintage of chenille. <laughs> it's been around a while. Uh, so I'm going to grab it with my hackle pliers and spin the daylights out of it until I get a nice round bushy rope. You can see that much better now. Then I will do the first wrap nice up against the tail and then I'm going to run it up in touching wraps all the way up the body of the leech. And sometimes you need another little twist to get to stay nice and bushy. When I get right behind the eye, I'll take it over top and in front of the eye and a couple of wraps right up to the bead. And at that point, I will take the bobbin rest out of the way 
and I will put three wraps in behind the bead and then three in front just to bind that chenille down really good. Trim it off close. And then the finish is simply to do a two standard whip finishes right behind the bead. So a fairly simple fly to tie, but the trick I find in it is that you, you need to play around with the materials to get the look that you want. And unfortunately, when I went in to get black chenille uh, at Robinson's, they didn't have any that was really what I wanted. So I ended up trying this stuff, which is called micro polar chenille. They didn't have any medium. They just had micro and then the fuzzy stuff. And this stuff was really hard to get a, a bulky body or something that had enough that stuck out. So I did a couple of tries with that and it wasn't particularly successful. And then I tried this other stuff, which is a uh, tri-lobal chenille that's a lot fuzzier. And it makes a really fuzzy body, but you can see from, from this guy here, how fuzzy it is. Now that, that might perfectly work if you're fishing for somebody that, you know, a fish that likes a lot of disturbance in the water. But quite frankly, I kind of, I kind of like this profile a little better. That's more like the standard balanced leeches that I'm familiar with. Uh, so I got a couple of those there. Uh, this is the one that had the the uh, the straggle string. And you can see it just it doesn't make a nice body <laughs> unless I haven't figured out how to wrap it on there better. So if, if you're going to do that for these size, for the smaller sizes, uh, you can do a balanced one like this. This is a non-balanced one, but you can do the balanced ones on the smaller ones with a smaller bead. But I think with the smaller flies and the really lightweight bead, it's probably not worth spending the time with the pin and everything to make it a balanced product. Just use a small enough bead that it, it's not too much um, butt down when it's on your end of your line. And if it's got a long enough tail, it'll, it'll, it'll do the same diving motion uh, as if it were a balanced beach. So that's, it other than I played around with a little bit of colors. The, the vampire one uses the, the uh, chartreuse bead, but you can do it with a different colored bead. You can use different shiny, uh, different marabou. This is a purple marabou. Uh, and I've got a similar chenille, wherever it is here. It is, it is sort of an olive color. Uh, and I think if I, I didn't have, I'm surprised I thought I had a bunch of olive uh, marabou, but I don't, I'll have to get some. But I would think if you did like an olive tail and a uh, olive uh, body, that would make a nice leech as well. And, and you could change the highlights on the tail by just using a different kind of flash. This is the other stuff I've tried it, uh, with. It's a, it's sort of a gold color flash. I just stuck that in as the tail. So that's it for me for the moment. Um, I, it's a fairly simple, straightforward pattern. And I will just stop highlighting me for a moment here. Where did I get? There we go. So we can get back to so that's, that's it. It's a fairly straightforward fly, fairly easy to tie. Uh, balance leeches work really well. If you're trolling them, I think it's, they're, they're okay effect, but I think if they're more effective as a balanced product, if you're do, using a uh, strike indicator 
and fishing them are like you would a coronamid, which means what you're going to do is you're going to put them on the end of your tippet uh, and you're going to put a little float on your, your uh, leader and try to get them down where you're maybe a foot off the bottom or off the lead bed and, uh, and basically doing a very slow retrieve and surface action and waves and stuff will cause a thing to bounce up and down. If you're going to trolling, troll it uh, at a slow troll, you probably don't need a balanced product, in which case you could probably use a regular straight eye hook rather than a jig hook. I was just giving more ideas on a very basic pattern that uh, has proven pretty effective. So there you go. Thanks, Dave. Okay. Questions? So, Dave, just before Florence starts, um, I don't know if anyone, any of you would be interested. I was doing work for a client and they had a bunch of these little display stands that they didn't want in the house when uh, it was sold or uh, rented out to someone else. And uh, these would be handy <clears throat> if you wanted to tie flies and use the little um, uh, test leads to hold your flies. You could drill holes in these and they would certainly hold them quite nicely. And I've got a, a ton of these. So if anyone wants any, let me know. We'll uh, make plans to get you these because I've got dozens, literally, I think like probably three or four dozen of them. So, so this is- What are they made out of? They're MDF, I think mostly. There are a few that are out of uh, wood, but uh, these ones that I'm looking at, I think are MDF from the looks of it. So that's, you're talking about doing a, a pre-snell and wrapping it around, is that the idea? No, no, no. This is like uh, when you're tying flies, just like you had on your little display ah, stand okay. with the test yeah. leads, you could drill holes in these around and you could have your flies on the test leads sitting in there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, you mean the, these yep. guys? Yep. Exactly. The test test kits. Yeah. 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 You can. Yeah. That would be good. Keep, keep yeah. them all. Particularly if you've got a, a, a epoxy ones that you're going to want to let dry for a while. Yeah. <clears throat> exactly. So if anyone wants any, this is just a sample. I've got, I think, slightly bigger ones than these. This one's probably about six inches in diameter. This one's probably about five and a half. And I've got slightly smaller ones. And I'm, I'm sure I've got some bigger ones as well. And I know I have some made out of wood as well. Or well, if you're on that, that oh. well, we're on that, fly boxes. Uh, um, from the sewing store, oh, they, wow. sell these, they sell these in a batch of four with different sets of compartments and they're cheap. Nice. Uh, it's like eight, eight or nine bucks for four of them. Oh. And they, they latch down nice. And this, they've got one of these, they've got one that's just got three or four compartments. They've got some that have mixed compartments and they come as a set in different colors. So inexpensive fly box. Dave, <clears throat> Dave, can I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, just this uh, couple of weeks ago, my sister-in-law donated to me the carcass of a hummingbird that died during natural courses during this uh, winter. Have you ever used anything from a hummingbird? No, I have not. We had one that croaked on us last winter it was it, 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 we found it laying frozen to death on our on our uh front step it had snuggled up against the door and not made it through the cold winter but we just we just buried him <laughs> i think <laughs> because because when, you look, when you look at it it's got a lot of reflective uh oh yeah feathers. particularly around the neck but those those feathers are going to be really small and hard to yeah manage. i think if you're going to tie like size 30 or smaller flies then that would be good <laughs> okay all right thank you i wouldn't have the heart to do it <laughs> oh i know that was the way i felt about it we felt so bad with because we've had uh we've had three hummingbirds for that really cold weather at our bird feeders our, our suet feed our feeders and yeah. we we got to the point where we were, when it was really cold there 
we were bringing the feeder in to thaw them out every two hours. And at night we would take them in and then put them out in the morning. And they were just hanging around waiting for you to step out the front door. Uh, I think one of them didn't make it. The other, the other two for sure are there, but uh, one of them may not have made it. Uh, it's pretty hard winter for those little suckers. It's the, they're the Anna's and they don't, they don't migrate. Uh, they stay here. So the winter, you know, cold winter like we've had is really tough on them. And one of the things the hummingbird expert at the hatchery goes on about is don't increase the amount of sugar. Yes. Stay at a quarter of a cup per, yeah, yeah a quarter of a cup per cup of water. Don't go to a third which is yeah. what some people do. It's just too much for them. Yeah, the, it's, it's not good for them to have too high a sugar content. And, and the other thing that for these cold weather, which I'm gonna try and rig up, if you can find an old uh, non-LED style Christmas bulb, and I think you can probably find them, they use them for night lights. Uh, you put them, put them on one of those, just underneath the feeder, or wrapped around the feeder, just to provide a little heat so that they don't, uh, they don't freeze right up. Uh, there's, I know that that they're out of stock now, but the the bird store sells commercially made ones that you can clamp around your underneath your hummingbird feeder, so it will keep keep it uh, warm enough that the it doesn't crystallize. But you do, you're right. You do have to make sure it's fairly dilute sugar. Well, Howard, feel free to bring some of those into the meeting. Yes. Yes, actually, I'll uh, I'll do that. I'll try and uh, I think this Tuesday I'm probably not working in the morning, so I think I'll try and come to the meeting and I'll bring a pile of them. Great. So, so Mohammed, I haven't heard yet back from Robin. I would expect sometime in the next week or so we'll we'll get, uh, get yeah. some information back on her and going up to Hanina. Okay. I'm, I'm really I'm really pleased that Joe is going to come along. He, he's he's a great guy to, to fish with. Sounds good. Yeah. Looking forward to meeting him and uh, going up there and fishing as well. So yeah, yeah, that'll be great. Good. If I could just make a point that PSS is having an auction in March. So they'll be looking for some fly box donations. Ah, yes. I think I've got a few <laughs> because doing these, these, these things, I have to tie five or six ahead of doing the demo. So I end up with spares. Some of them might be a little ragged, but <laughs> the ragged that's ones are the ones that catch the fish. Yeah, I think that's true. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Uh, just how much money PSS makes on those fly boxes, you know? Like, yeah. Uh, I think uh, the last auction we had fly boxes from uh, Haig Brown and Golden Rods and Reels. And, you know, we made close to a thousand dollars because we had uh, uh, about eight fly boxes. It's just wonderful. I, speaking of, uh, of, of the, uh, the business of, Sometimes the ugly flies work. I remember, uh, oh, this goes way back. There was some guy on the West Coast here who was experimenting with, uh, this would go way back because they were experimenting with downriggers and, and flashers and stuff like that. And uh, he, I forget what his name is. Anyway, he had, he had a camera attached to his downrigger so he could see what was happening when they were trolling for, for, uh, for Chinooks. And, he, uh, he had tried to figure out what roll weight, roll rate attracted them. And he had just flies out the back for some of these with, a, with no dodger, just the thing. And he had them going on the, he figured out how to make them roll. And he says, some of the flies wouldn't work. So he decided, he said, the way, the real solution here is he put them in the bilge where all the, all the oil and crap on the boat was and strung them out behind the boat. And he says, those work the best. <laughs> The ones that had been trodden on and stuck in the bills. <laughs> hey, Dave, I could tell you his name, Charlie yeah. White. Charlie White, that's right. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. He was a character from what I could see. He manufactured a lure 
and everybody bought them. And I had never heard of anybody catching fish with his lure, but he caught them. <laughs> maybe maybe that's because nobody put them in the bills and stood on them. <laughs> yeah, right. Ah, oh, dear. Okay, so Florian, you're, you're on. Thank you, Dave. <clears throat> now, I don't think I'm going to be showing you any. It's just that I think switching the materials around a little bit uh, may be worth experimenting with. And my sense is that especially in a smaller fly, uh, this might not be a bad idea. So here's a here's a sample finish fly here. You can see. Um, this is basically nothing but a Clouser minnow, right? Or <laughs> my idea of what a Clouser minnow might be. Okay. So in that sense, nothing nothing fancy. So I took some some streamer hooks. I put some, uh, instead of dumbbells, I just put some uh, bead chain eye. So you basically, you get the flipped fly, but without the extra, without the extra weight. So if you're looking for something that you wanna fish in shallow water and it's not gonna snag, this is a pretty good, uh, this is a pretty good way to achieve, uh, to achieve that. And so what I've, what I've been tying this, this morning, you know, I've done a few, uh, so I, you can also do these things without any any beads. So this is the simplest version, just a, a piece of a, a little bit of white, and then a few strands of blue, or you can layer it like in the clousers and do, or similar streamers, and you can do white and blue with a few strands of, of flash. And I believe that the flash material is the same stuff that Dave was using in red. It comes in a, in a variety of colors. And I have here, I have some, uh, I have some blue. And there are different shades of blue if you like different colors. And then there is another one that I'm going to tie the demonstration fly here with, which is called gunmetal. It's sort of a dark, well, gunmetal, yeah. I guess. It's a, like a dark, dark silverish thing. And it's, as you can see under the light, whoops, ah, a little tangly. Uh, but it's, it's a very soft, what I like about this is it's actually much softer, I think, even than the, um, than the, you know, the, the good uh, flashaboo and, and even softer than crystal flash, I would, I would think. And that's why I think this could be a good match for the uh, for the fox. So anyway, I prepared my hook already, and I placed the eyes a little bit back from the eye of the hook, so I can I can actually tie it in a in a in a clouser style. It's kind of convenient. The alternative to that, what you could do, is rather than preparing the hooks beforehand, which I find just convenient. You tie your fly and leave yourself enough room at the head, and then you can stick on the eyes as the last thing you do. But you have to be really disciplined and leave yourself room at the head of the fly. This way you don't have to do uh, too much thinking about that because once you've placed the eyes in the right place, then you're off to the races basically. Okay, so start the thread and I'm going to do I don't think it's really essential to do a body other than for the pleasure of the fisherman tying this. So just take a little bit of wire. So this is a medium silver wire for ribbing. And put it down along the hook shank. And go all the way to where the bend of the hook starts. Then take yourself some um, flashy material, some mylar of some kind. So I have here something that was sold as Christmas tinsel. And the problem with those materials is that, yes, they're cheap on a per unit basis, but you basically have to buy a ludicrous amount. So this is a bunch of, you know, 
Christmas tree decoration from uh, from Canadian Tire, and I just took a strand of it. It's a little bit fragile, so ribbing it is is absolutely essential. And I'm going to take advantage of the rotary vise. And here is a little trick that I discovered. If you have already dumbbell or bead chain eyes on your fly, just put the thread over and leave it there. You don't need any knots or any fancy footwork. It's just going to stay put and you do your thing. So start wrapping the, uh, the tinsel. This is same color on both sides, so you don't have to worry about any of that fun stuff. And keep going, keep going. And at some point, you've gone far enough, you just stop and secure the tinsel. Wraps three if you're a little paranoid like I am. And off it goes. Then back to the drawing board for the wire. And the first turn here, careful not to catch the hook tip. And basically, this is going to make this really sturdy. If you want it super extra sturdy, you can also stop at this point with a wire and basically prepare all your hooks beforehand and then give them a coat of Sally Hansen's. And that is going to, well, it's going to dull a little bit the flashiness on the body, but it's also going to, you know, even if you're fishing for pike, the, the pike teeth are just not going to rip your, your things. Okay, so now let's remember, this is a flip fly, so the top of the hook is actually going to be the belly, and that's where the white goes. And I'm going to take, I have a piece of, uh, this is tail fur. It's a little bit longer. I have here some some body fur. And this one is also a little bit, um, it's got a little bit more stiffness in the tail than this uh, patch of, of regular body. And so if you have a bigger fly, you want this hair, which is a little bit longer. There is a limit to, to the size of flies you can tie with this with this kind of stuff. But I think if you, um, if you're the, the kind of person who likes their, their flies a little smaller, this is, this is probably just about perfect. So I don't, normally my streamers, even, even for pike, they're not much bigger than this. And then you have to decide how bulky or slim you want your, you want your fly to be. And again, this is a fairly slim material once it gets wet. And I wish I could just pass one of these on to Tony and have him put in the tank and <laughs> tell me how, you know, actually show us how it actually works. If I just put it under the, under the tap, it compresses to a very, very skinny profile. And in fact, what I did for the for the pictures that I posted. Okay, so this is about the length I'm going to do. I put it on here. I attach it right behind the bead chain. Three or four turns here. And then I leave this the stub up, move my thread over the bead chain eyes in front. And then a little bit further to the closer to the eye of the hook just leave like a one eye eye length behind and attach this i think this is kind of standard um, standard clouser procedure at least how i remember it it may not be but so this way this is very safely secured And I can now go back to the other side. 
Now on this side, what I want is I want a little bit of this flash. And you can vary the color of the flash. So for, for this one, because I'm going to go with, uh, with chartreuse, I've decided that uh, this gunmetal is a good one. I have some stuff that's black, basically, which I also think would be a nice, uh, nice color combination. And so what I do is I take a few of these, like actually a couple of strands is, is plentiful. And you see what happens is where this came off the bundle and was bent, you can see it's kinked. Yeah. So what I do is I just basically grab this together because this is the only place where I have any kink. I just cut it off. And there you go, no kink. And then fold this, this bundle in roughly in half. And just hook it over your hook. Whoops. Mm. And then catch with a few turns. And then you know you can you can be happy with it as it as it is. Or you could say, nah, you know, I want these things to be each on their own side and and you know nicely lined up and whatever so you can at this point you just grab it carefully pull it all back hold on to it and attach it with a few more turns okay and this should do the trick so this basically here it's just going to be a lateral line. And then to finish off the fly, you can use whatever color you want. In this case, I'm just going to use some chartreuse. The, um, the beauty of Arctic Fox is that, you know, the white fur can be dyed in any color, right? This is just like polar bear in that, in that respect. Okay, so take now a little bit of, of chartreuse. I've been told that this is a good color to fish in murky water. So I'm going to try. I've had some unpleasant experiences with murky lake water this summer, uh, even in places where the water traditionally used to be very nice and clean. And so in a little one of these little online fly tying sessions, uh, somebody was quite knowledgeable um said ah oh, well chartreuse is the thing to use in murky water so there is there's the chartreuse and now the only challenge is because at this point you have you're tying this with the hooks upside down so here if there's too much fuzz at the tip but the other thing with um fox hair i should have said is don't even dream of stacking the stuff the moment you take your fingers of it it just goes everywhere and sticks to everything. So here I just have to do a soft loop. I don't know if that's probably not very visible on camera, but basically I just did a soft loop with a thread and then just caught those stub ends with the thread as well as possible. That secures the fur very well. Okay. Now, if you think you're satisfied with where everything is, smooth it out a little bit and grab the whip finisher and whip finish. There you go. Couple of whip finishes. And then I think it does make the streamers look a little bit nicer if you put a little bit of the Sally Hansen's right over your head here, over the threads. Try to avoid touching the fox because those fibers are going to 
want to stick to the glue quite badly and that might produce a bit of a mess see there you are there's a bit of a mess in the making and I'm gonna try to clean this up now how would I do that well one is you know just use your fingers and hope for the best the other thing to do is and I I have this always I don't always use it but I always have it handy on the on the bench this is just a pair of tweezers uh, that are available very very close to where you buy your Sally Hansen's right so if you want the cashier to be even more puzzled uh, when you go to the checkout you also buy yourself one of these things now you know one goes a long way but basically for plucking you know when you tie dry flies or or anything where you have stray hairs and things there's a reason why these are used for plucking eyebrows and whatnot because they also work on flies the best right so and that's um that's the chartreuse version and i'm really looking forward to trying this uh, on pothole lakes that are stocked with trout and i will not be shy putting this on a floating line and fishing it in a stream in shallow water both this guy and the blue version and for pike i'm going to tie myself a few of these with white and i have some kind of um, pinkish color i don't know what this would be officially called yeah. this color on top so you know this kind of the um fly fishing equivalent of the old Len Thompson's. Yeah. The white and red. And I found that this this sort of pinkish, hot pinkish color is something that Pike really, really like. And they also like things that softly swim through the water. And I'm hoping that the, uh, the fox fur is going to prove a little bit more resistant to teeth. Uh, compared to um, hackle, which is what I've been using the last few years with with quite a bit of uh, success. So essentially, getting the white in the fly. So you could do the same fly that I've done here. You know, keep the keep the chartreuse and the and the flash material, but instead of the white, uh, or you can keep this and add a pair of hackles, one on each side of the hook. And that would uh, that would give it quite a quite a bit of extra action, okay. And that's it. I mean, it's just a an idea of you know substituting the fox fur in a bunch of otherwise standard flies to achieve a different uh, to achieve a different action. That's really what this is all um, what this is all about. And the extra stiffness, what I'm hoping is going to uh, is going to get me. Is that marabou has a has a habit of when it's tied long like this has a habit of tangling up um and i think the i think this fur has just enough stiffness to it that it, you're not going to get that tangling problem but it's still at this stage i haven't i haven't had the chance to fish with these things so it's still a, a theoretical point but i think they'll catch fish and that's my little bit of, of mind. So, so where do you source your, your fox fur? Oh, well, I'm always on the lookout for materials. I'm one of these material squirrels, you know. Um, and so whenever I go to an online shop and buy um, something, I, uh, I look to see if they have Arctic Fox. A few of the suppliers I can tell you. Uh, one is Doak in New Brunswick. Uh, another one I think is a Quebec fellow called Ami de Mouchoir. And he's in somewhere Trois-Rivières or something. I can, I, can, I can put the links or, 
I can yeah the names on on chat and then um, one of our local fly shops in Edmonton does seem to have some uh, some fox so you know when I when I talk about expensive you're you're looking at um, a pack of, of fur so I, I bought some black because some of the patterns and I, I trying to see if yeah I did I did one with um, with black so let me show you the black one so a pack of this stuff can run anywhere from from six to ten dollars mm. so compared you know like you you buy a little patch of fox you can buy a whole bucktail right but then you know so this is the black version so this is black and white 